Okay. Call a meeting of the North Pole South Pole Regional School Committee of uh, Jan Wednesday, January 16th, 2019, into session. First item on the agenda is action on the minutes of our open meeting of December 19th, 2018. Paul. I will refer the minutes from our open meeting of December 19th. Moved by Paul, seconded by Dan. Um, do I have any um, comments or changes? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor of approving the minutes? Uh, opposed and abstain. Okay, um, one abstention. How many we, how many we? Six in favor. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is educational policy approval of um, the DECA overnight trip uh, to Boston and approval of the music department overnight trip to Allstate in Boston as well. So, Paul. Well, I, I think there's no reason not to bundle these two together. These are annual events and we've supported them for as long as I've been around. So, I move that we accept the overnight field trip application for both the DECA trip and the Boston music trip. Second. Moved by Paul, seconded by Dan. Um, any uh, discussion? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor? That's approved. Unan uh, unanimously. Next, we have new business, the athletic update. Yeah, Mike. There you go. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, last we met, we uh, met earlier in the fall. So, I have a little bit of rundown for the end of the fall and beginning of winter since we're about halfway through. So, um, you know, with our fall season complete and the opportunity, we had a bunch of teams that had an opportunity to compete in tournament. And for the norm for Algonquin Athletics, our athletics continue to represent the school, the communities, and the outstanding performances on the field by exhibiting sportsmanship through excellence in the classroom. So, just a quick rundown of the athletic department um, and where we kind of stand with our current fields of 58 teams. Um, we have featuring 31 varsity sports. And we have 70 coaches on staff plus volunteers working with over 900 student athletes, which is comprises close to 70% of our student body. So it's a great number. Um, at the end of the fan, uh, fantastic fall season, we had a bunch of teams participate in tournament. Uh, we have boys and girls cross country qualify for districts and states. We have boys cross country team participate in states for the first time since 1997, which is a great accomplishment. Other teams that qualify for tournaments were boys and girls soccer. Volleyball, field hockey, and cheering. Game day cheering finished fifth in the states and performance qualified for nationals for the first time in school history. So they will be competing in Atlanta, Georgia in April. So it's a great accomplishment for the cheering team, the performance team. We had 25 student athletes named Midwatch League All-Stars. Um, we had two league MVPs, golf and field hockey. We had one uh, Division One sectional champions, which was boys golf, which finished seventh in the state. So great, great turnout for the fall tournament participation. Um, this year, which was a little bit different, we uh, brought back National Signing Day, which was on Wednesday, November 14th, which recognizes our student, eight student athletes. We had eight of them that signed um, a national letter of intent to play at, at Division One and Two collegiate athletics, which I think is great and great representation of Algonquin athletics having the opportunity to play at the next level. Um, we're also, as a goal of mine, in regards to getting athletics out into the community throughout the fall. Um, we, it was, it's been about seven years since athletics last presented the Northboro and Southboro Senior uh, with complimentary sport passes to the athletic events, which we're excited about bringing this back this year. Um, athletic Council marched in the Southboro Heritage Day Parade, and 21, uh, 20 of our student athletes were excited to represent ARHS within our community. The goal in 2019 is to march both in Applefest and in the Heritage Day Parade in Southboro. Um, and this was the first year that we actually participated in the parades through Athletic Council. Athletic Council and the student athletes also read at Peasley Elementary School on Wednesday, November 14th. And again, the Athletic Council will continue to be an active and empowering student athletes to feel invested in the athletic department and to enhance school spirit, sportsmanship, and to be active in the community service. Um, Best Buddies held their annual friendship walk <coughs> in Bolton. We got the invite through Neshoba Regional High School. None of the uh, of our teams have participated before, so I extended it out to our coaches. And uh, I got to give a great, uh, you know, a, a thank you to Algonquin cheerleaders who came out and participated in that and supported the Best Buddy Walk and the Friendship Walk. 
Um, they had a great time. They were face painting, and uh, they were walking around and representing Algonquin in their gear. It was great. It was a, it was there was one one team that represented our school. It was cheerleaders. It was great. Um, our impact testing is out and implemented since 2016 and 17 as a resource for our families, student athletes, and their primary care physicians to use as concussion testing. So that is up and going and has been released again this year, starting in the fall. Um, our fall participation numbers, we had over 500 student athletes participate in fall athletics, slightly down compared to 2017 and 18. However, we saw an increase in the numbers of boys and girls in cross country, volleyball, cheering, and even numbers with girls in boys soccer. Um, something that the athletics that I love to continue doing, I think we've had great turnout, um, and a lot of student athletes that represent Algonquin is our TIOC of the month. And uh, we've had 17 TIOC of the month award recipients between September and December. Um, this award continues to recognize outstanding student athletes for the demonstration of leadership, teamwork, sportsmanship, and excellence on and off the field of play. Our student ambassador program, we have three student ambassadors and uh, we have attended two conferences so far. We've been to the leadership conference at Gillette Stadium, um, and we are looking to go to Girls and Women in Sports Day, which is gonna be held on in uh, February 1st in Boston. Um, our unified program, which was stated in the fall, great accomplishment, was one out of 10 schools that was nationally ranked in regards to a, nat um, a national banner school. And that's one out of 10 in Massachusetts and one out of 147 in, Mass in uh, all nationally. And this is a, a dedication to the recognition of our student athletes to their role and in inclusion in sports. Our captain's breakfast was, was a success. We held it in the fall uh, with our fall team captains and we're gonna hold it again in February with our winter team captains. And uh, this is when we have our captains come out and we answer the question, what is my role and why was I voted team captain? We get a lot of interaction about that, a lot of group work and we get a lot of feedback and talk, which always resolves around leadership. Um, and now into our winter season, which we've started um, back on November 31st, I believe it was, it was that, that Monday after Thanksgiving. We are part, we're in a good spot where our participation is up by 5%. We had over 400 athletes participating and saw an increase in boys and girls basketball, co-ed swimming, boys and girls track, gymnastics, <clears throat> and skiing. Uh, we added a boys freshman hockey team this year, which was great, all great news where we started off with the winter. Um, we have joined to our coach staff, we've, if we've have uh, new coaches that are on staff and I, the reason why I want to talk to this is because they have a strong tie to the Algonquin community. We have uh, new coaches with gymnastics in regards to um, ARH graduates and that are involved with the gymnastics team, the boys basketball team and the girls basketball team. All either a graduate or a teacher within the building, which I think is that builds the community and builds the relationships with our student athletes. Um, our winter season results and we're about you know, halfway through that midpoint so far, our boys and girls basketball teams were invited to play at the Garden, TD Garden, in the Good Sports Invitational on January 6th. Um, our hockey, boys hockey team won the Burroughs Cup and the Daily News Tournament for the first time in school history, and uh, which is certainly exciting. Gymnastics and boys and girls swim and dive are undefeated right now. They're 8-0 and 10-0, uh, 8-0 in our league. Um, girls hockey is off to 7-2 and two start with big games. Skiing and, girl, uh, skiing and girls and boys had top finishers um, and the team, girls team won week two giant slalom. Boys and girls track are three and one, earning personal and school records throughout. And wrestling has had wins against Quabbin and Marlboro, competing the Lowell Invitational and hosted quads versus Framingham. Um, and I don't know if you've ever had a chance to go and see one of these wrestling quads, but they're they're, they're pretty fun, and, and it's, it's pretty entertaining. It's great. The kids work extremely hard. All the sports, they work extremely hard. And cheer, um, they are at our game day every Friday performing. Um, not necessarily a set schedule throughout the year, but they are there to cheer on our boys and girls basketball teams throughout for game day. Um, our weight room, we had added our maintaining our equipment, and we uh, added uh, four new treadmills uh, at the beginning of this year with the goal of adding uh, two new stationary bikes, two new grounded bikes, and two new ellipticals going into 2019. Um, I'd like to say thank you uh, to the Booster Club. I mentioned the Booster Club for the continued support and dedication for our student athletes. Boosters and athletics will continue to work together to support our teams and invest in future upgrades for our fields and facilities. All the uh, individual teams and team representatives did an amazing job for fall helping with concessions, acting as ticket takers, organizing fundraisers, and providing tremendous overall support for our student athletes. 
Our current project that athletics are working on is in the spring. We're looking to upgrade the, uh, the scoreboard facings for the softball field and the JV football field and upgrading the battery system. Um, I'd like to say a special thanks to all those make this possible. Uh, the central office, Superintendent Johnson, Principal Walsh, the admin team at ARHS, Facilities Department for their hard work in helping preparing facilities for practices and games. John Drisco, our athletic trainer, our superb coaching staff, Susan Burns, and, uh, and our truly um, outstanding student athletes. Um, our, just to give you a heads up, going into uh, spring, we have our spring sports night for player and parents on Monday, March 4th. Um, our first day of spring sports is uh, Monday, March 18th. And the registration for spring sports opens up February 15th and will run through March 12th. And um, so that's as we prepare to open up the spring season. Please continue to show your support for the five young men and women by attending both the home and away games this winter season. So um, thank you, and I will hopefully see all of you at the games. Thank you. I'm Paul. So I didn't that. That was ter terrific. I mean, the sports program is always wonderful, and it seems like it's getting better. What is, am I misreading these impact test results numbers? I mean, is, is, is the testing just completely fallen out of favor? I mean, we only had three new tests taken this year, only 22 last year, 250 almost the, the year before. I mean, we have 1,000 athletes. I, I mean, it, it's, what's happening there? I think the year it was implemented was 2016-17, so it gets <coughs> right out of the date, uh, right out of the gate. I think over the years, Algonquin has done a fantastic job on focusing uh, their awareness with concussion and preventing concussion training. Um, I think that in conversations with the uh, with the nurses in the health department, I, that the number of concussions of where we're at this year has been down compared to what it was last year. So how do you um, know if they don't take the test? And so just documented concussions. Documented concussions just to compare where we were at this year, who's documented to where we were last year. Um, and I think the overall, like I said, the overall in spring is not included yet, so they have not taken the test, so we're wait, waiting to see the if anyone year, is asked. The last year was comprehensive. I mean, yeah. we went from 236 kids taking the test to 22. And is, it, is it discredited? Is it not a, a valid test? I mean, I, I've always thought this was something that we should be encouraging. It, it doesn't seem like we could, I, I suspect we could put a little more weight behind it and get few more kids to take it if it's if it's a good test to be taken yep. it's free for them right yep. it gives it, it creates this is the one that creates the baseline so that we can I mean, I, I, mean I, I don't have any kids in the program anymore but do we have so, thoughts on it? so I know that like when it first came out I did have my boys do it um, and I think that I had Ella do it I don't know how many years it's good for um, one year uh, it's just good for yeah. one year yeah so and I don't you know, I don't know if it's something that you can have the papers available when you walk out of the sports night, just to say or have. And I think it also depends on sometimes like the different sports, like that are, the kids are playing. You know. Yeah, but still, I mean, if there were 236 one year, then there should and it, and the test is only valid for a year. I mean, it struck me that we ought to maybe have a couple of hundred being taken the year after or something, but no, I mean. Anyway, just yeah, a comment. I think that yep. those numbers, I don't, I'm not thrilled with that at all. I mean, and, and you know, for the for the health of the kids and stuff. If there's something you could do to push that, yeah, it wouldn't be a bad idea. Okay, perfect. Did you get any pass out flyers? Yes. Joan? Uh, thank you for your report. It's always great yeah. to have you here at the second time this year, and I hope that we hear from you again in the spring. Yeah. But it's great to hear the update. I also agree with Paul. I think with all the current talk and topics and studies done at BU on concussions and former athletes. I think it's very important to do it. So whatever we can do to increase the number, because I was thinking when I saw the numbers as Paul did, when I saw the 236, I thought, well, maybe that takes for a couple of years, but if it's only good for a year. So if there's some way that we can establish it, because I think it would be for the betterment of the students and, and as they go into their uh, careers. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to just to commend you on um, what the athletic council did by going into Peasley School. I know the last uh, Northborough School Committee meeting, or the one before Dr. Jill Barnhart, 
principal of the Beasley School did mention that and how widely accepted it was and how the kids really loved it. So thank you for going in and have the athletes do, athletes do it. I know the kids will always look up to them in that way. So if you can continue doing that, going into Southboro, giving them the same equal opportunity, that would be great. Um, all the stuff that you're mentioning is absolutely fantastic and you're like the biggest cheerleader, you know, for our athletic department. Have you or will you be planning to going into both middle schools uh, to take the athletes before, you know, for the eighth graders as they come in? Is that something that's being planned or has it been done? Is, yeah, it is absolutely planned. It's at the end of each year we, broke, we go into the middle schools and we talk about the uh, opportunity for clubs and activities and athletics. And we talked about we bring our coaching staff, we bring our students, we go over to the middle schools, we talk about the sports that are offered coming into the fall. We will also talk about the sports that are offered in the winter and the spring, but more or less it's like a kickoff for the sports that are coming up at the end of last year to get them ready and prepared for the fall and what is offered when they first come into the high school. Mm -hmm. And I think even highlighting some of the leadership opportunities like going to Gillette, <clears throat> you know, being part of the T-Hawk Award, being on Athletic Council is also wonderful because you never know what students may go into sports management as they're in their next career. And my last question was, what about intramurals? Do you have an intramural program set up not for quite. this for those students that are not the athletes that they could, you know, the kids want to get together and play volleyball or something like that? Currently, there's one intramural program that's being run through Northboro Recreation that is run here through basketball, which is on Sunday nights. It's offered through. It's offered for anybody who may not have the ability to participate in a winter sport, may not want to participate in winter sport, but will want to play recreation. So they have that option to play on Sunday nights uh, through Northboro Recreation that takes place here um, for basketball. Mm -hmm. But as, as far as intramural sports, I just had a conversation with Northboro Rec looking to expand those opportunities going into the spring. We actually just had that conversation today about kind of expanding off of, uh, recre of um, intramural different mm -hmm. sports other than basketball. Yeah, that would be good to do, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Other comments? Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, I uh, agree. It's uh, it's uh, awesome to have some of these uh, things come back, the Tiak of the Month, and um, it's, it's, uh, it's good to see the kids recognized and all the different leadership opportunities you're providing the captains. I mean, I played, you know, in high school, and I was elected captain, but I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> so I think it's, uh, it just, I showed up and led by example, I guess. But uh, anyways, uh, thank you for providing all those added, added um, programs for the students so that they really can become leaders of the teams, um, uh, peer leaders. So thanks. I just want to add, it's hard to believe Mike's only been in this position since July. He's in-depth knowledge and his enthusiasm is contagious. We did have an opportunity to meet for several hours uh, yep. over the um, holiday break. And Mike, I don't know if you want to speak to the um, handbook, the review of the handbook and the committee that you have formed to update what clearly needs um, to be updated after uh, reviewing some of the contents and appreciating that that was uh, put together probably in yeah. 1998, I think, at some point. So we're in the midst of, uh, as, as, you, as you just made aware, we had a nice collaborative and informative meeting that took place uh, prior to break or right after break. Um, that brought up a lot of interesting points and, and subjects that we would like to touch on, improve, and made me aware of and us aware of on, on safety and guide to athletics and stuff that we can just kind of, kind of break into a point where we can improve on now stuff that we can take a look at in regards to data, uh, get feedback from other surrounding schools, um, and, and see what we can kind of fix right now, which has been addressed. Some issues have been addressed, and uh, more communication, more dialogue uh, in regards to some of the topics that were brought up, and has been, you can check that off in regards. And there's other uh, conversation that took place with my mid-watch athletic directors um, last Friday to provide feedback of what it is like without in different types of schools and communities. And now we're in the midst of forming a committee to take a, take a look at the guide to athletics that I believe that we can make stronger and update and um, looking to get input from not only parents, but uh, coaches and uh, athletes and um, um, 
administration, uh, all kind of collaborating, and that, for, that committee's hoping to be formed relatively soon so we can take a look at all aspects that, that the Guide to Athletics touches on so to make sure that we're up to date and current with not only uh, how other schools operate, but with uh, MIA rules and, and um, regulations. So that's, that's, in the, in the, that's, in, that's taking part right now and hopefully have that committee together relatively soon. Um, in that guide to athletics, could you highlight uh, the impact testing and even for some parents, even just a small blur, but even give them uh, maybe some um, websites that they could go to yep. to read about it. I would just like to feel like what Paul says, I want to be a cheerleader. I want to get more of those numbers up because I think it's very beneficial for our students. Okay. Dudley? Not to dwell on the impact testing. <laughs> 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 um, but when you are, because I am, you know, your well pre predecessor this was such a big deal mm -hmm. for a long time okay. with a lot of parents and so i too am concerned how did this fall off the cliff so um when you are um getting together with your mia folks and or if you have access to data it would be interesting i think to all of us to see how we are comparing versus other okay. um, high school programs because you know this is just a this is just something that is prevalent with you know all schools then you know it's a societal problem but if it's just us then we should know that okay thank you yep. absolutely so, so i guess i will say like i think that maybe one reason it is a piece of paper that your child takes home and there's a code on it so that's why i think that if you're at a meeting and you actually have the papers available there and not at the athletic office because they're not you know what i mean i think that there's a disconnect between the kid getting the paper and bring it home. I think that if you had it and you handed it to somebody as they're walking out the door, chances are the numbers would go up mm -hmm. because they have it right there. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Any other? Go ahead. <coughs> Thank you, Mike. Okay. That's great. Um, next, we have our World Language Department presentation. Cold member, our World Language Department chair, and teammates, I guess, and keeping with the sports. My cheerleaders. Our cheerleaders. Thank you all for letting us join you. <laughs> um, to talk to you about the great things that we do here at Algonquin and within the World Languages Department. First, I wanted to start off with this picture. This is everyone in the department, all the French, Spanish, and Latin teachers. And while not everyone could make it here tonight, they all wanted to say hi to you. So here we are. And on that note, I would like to introduce to you two of our new hires this year. We have Yakaida. Is this working? No. Oh, it is? Okay. Oh, fantastic. Okay. So we have Yakaida Gonzalez. She recently graduated college and she was born and raised in Puerto Rico. And we also have Evan Greenwald here. Some of you may recognize him. He was a former Algonquin student here. And um, he loved Spanish and became a teacher and loved Algonquin so much that he wanted to stay. So that's <laughs> success to me. And we're so happy to have them part of our team. They're doing a fantastic job. You can see here for the Spanish department, this is the list of teachers here, and those are the course offerings that we have. Students have many courses that they have the opportunity to take all the way up to level five, and we have advanced placement with an overall score of four, and we're very proud of that. It's a, a lot of work that the students and the teachers are doing to prepare the kids to be successful. And hopefully next year, we're considering adding another elective in Spanish. It would be Spanish history through film, so just another great opportunity that our Spanish students have to take a variety of courses. We have been able to 
acquire a new set of books, Avon Samuels, for our levels one, two, and three. And I can't tell you how, exciting we are, how excited we are as teachers and students to be able to use this. It has a plethora of resources. We have technology, videos, authentic audio activities, writing, speaking activities that we use with the kids in the classroom. And as educators, we understand how important it is to feel connected, for the students to feel connected and have meaningful experiences with what they're learning. And so one of the challenges that we had faced with the old set, the Realidades, was it had vocabulary words that we were trying to teach the kids, such as cassette tapes, <laughs> phone booths, <laughs> and VHS tapes. So it's a little challenging you know, to try to teach them that stuff when they have never seen it themselves. Kind of, I'm kind of dating myself here. I know about that stuff, but they don't. And so we are very excited to have the new books throughout the curriculum so in that way the kids can enjoy the learning and, and really get connected with the material. Not only in Spanish, but throughout the department in Latin and French, we work hard to have the kids hone their speaking, listening, reading, and writing skills. And we have a variety of activities that we do within the classroom. But here on the left, you could see that our level four students, they did this activity in which they had um, a murder mystery. And they learned about the preterite and the imperfect. And that's basically, those tenses are used when you want to talk about an event in the past. They went and had a lot of fun with this. They were creative. They did something where, you know, Aunt Jemima was, was murdered by, you know, Betty Crocker or, you know, <laughs> Colonel Sanders or, um, you know, all these different characters. But they presented the presentation in Spanish and in front of the class, so they utilized all those skills. And we also have another activity on the right with the Spanish artists. That's for a level three. Students were learning about art and, and music. And so individually, they researched a Spanish artist and found a work of art. And then they had to give a presentation in the target language in front of the class. That was done in, individually. But the kids all wanted to get together as a whole group project for everyone. This right here, La Catrina, is just a novel. What we've done in the curriculum, in addition to all these different activities, is we've incorporated novels for uh, the honor students. It's a great accomplishment for them to have, after they've read a, a novel, to be able to say that they read a chapter book in the target language that they're learning. And so we do this, and we have several different novels. But this one in particular, it's, I just wanted to show you the great work that the kids are, are doing. They really get excited about it. This video is nine minutes long. <laughs> um, we're not going to take the whole time to watch it. But I would like you to take a minute just to see some of the great work that they're doing. You can tell that they're invested in it, and they're utilizing the language. And that's really what we want the kids to do. So I'm going to show you just a quick video footage of it. So you get the gist of it, right? I mean, I find that to be very impressive, and it's mm -hmm. exciting to see the kids really just run with the activities that we ask of them to do. This slide here is just a representation of what we've done this year. You know, Northboro and Southboro, it's a big school district. There are many schools. There are many students and, and teachers. And what we're really excited about is this year, we had some Spanish teachers at Algonquin get together with the two middle schools, Spanish teachers at the two middle schools. And we've collaborated with one another. The middle schools are also, they've acquired the Avancemos textbooks. And so we got to talk about not only horizontal curriculum alignment, but 
vertical as well. Um, and it's been nice. We, we had some great discussions about what do we, what skill sets do we want our students to know at the end of seventh, eighth grade and all throughout high school. And we're excited about this process. We're going to continue throughout the year and hopefully this will be a common practice that we do as a group throughout the three schools. And the French teachers have done this as well in the past couple of years and they still can continue to communicate with one another. So again, we're really excited about this. It only helps us to be better teachers and provide a better education for our students within the classroom. Okay, here's Latin in the courses that we offer. It's a robust program that we have, and they have many different activities that they do as well. For example, students just took, um, they took, chose a topic about Roman Britain and or Roman military, and they created a podcast. And it amazes me to see all this work being done, how well versed they are in technology. They create iMovies, podcasts, they do a green screen in the back, and it's exciting to see. So they had a great time with that. They're also going to be doing another project about something that I personally love, which is food. I mean, who doesn't love food, right? Um, and so they're gonna talk about Roman cuisine and they're gonna take a look and read Roman poetry about food. They're gonna take a look at ancient recipes and they're gonna create foods and then bring it into the classroom. They're gonna eat it all and have a good party and have fun. But it's just another great, or another example of how the students utilize the material in fun, engaging ways and they're learning and they don't even really know it. These are the textbooks that we use, the Cambridge Latin course, units two and three. This year, we've been able to acquire new textbooks. To the right, you'll see Latin of New Spain. It's a, compila a compilation of stories that's geared towards teaching in the Latin classroom. So the teachers are excited about that, and they're happy to be able to incorporate that into the curriculum. On the left, you'll see some Latin students. The, the club went into Boston this year. Last year, they went into the Museum of Fine Arts in which they looked at Roman and Greek artifacts. And this year, they're gonna have a trivia night at the, senior, the Northborough Senior Center as well, which is a great way for them to establish connections between students and teachers and the community. We do such great work here at Algonquin, and it's nice for the community to see the students and how great they are and they can contribute in other ways, just other than being in the school. And to the right, we can't help but have so much fun. <laughs> we all decided to get together and do as the Romans do and wear togas and get comfortable. And uh, the students enjoyed seeing us in a different light as well. So the two teachers we have for French are Paula Bombron and Lauren Osipchuk. These are the courses that we offer, levels one through four, and we have AP as well. The overall score is four, again, as in Spanish, and we're just really proud of the accomplishments of the students and the teachers. We've been able to acquire all new textbooks again, so those teachers are just as excited as we are about the new resources that we have. So we have Bien Deep for levels one, two, and three. And here are a couple examples of all the fun that they're having. To the right, you'll see some students, what they did during the National French Week this week, um, this year they decided to choose a famous French person and dress up as them. They, so they had a costume contest. They also had a poster contest and they had a party in which they brought in French cuisine. And to the left you'll see there's a gentleman, Mr. Le Boronec, who is a native of France. And he came in because his child was in the, in the class and he talked to the students about what it's like to live in, in France, talked about the food and the culture, and they all had a really great time. This is a picture of all the clubs. I, we have French, Latin, and Spanish clubs. This is just a picture of the students that they met at a restaurant to enjoy Mexican food, and they learned about how to make Mexican masks, our clubs, and we also have the Spanish um, Honor Society. This is the, their induction ceremony. They do so many different activities, whether it's doing peer tutoring to help students that need extra help in the language, 
Last year they went to the elementary schools and they helped with an art project in a program and they read to students and um, they're just, they do so much work outside of just what, you know, helping out in the classroom or doing fun things in their whatever language they're learning about. This is just some points, talking points I wanted to talk to you about. Um, last year with Hurricane Maria, there was a lot of devastation in Puerto Rico. And what we did as a whole department is we decided to work together and we had students donate money, uh, willingly, okay, we didn't force them. Um, <laughs> we also contributed for if we wanted and we were able to raise $2,000.45 and we took that money and gave it to United and UNICEF. So I think it's a great way that we could show everyone how we not only work hard for just Algonquin, but for others as well. And you know, hopefully we help some people that were less fortunate. We also attend MAFLA conferences every year. So at least two people, generally more, but at least two go to these conferences. And we can choose which kind of workshop we would like to see or attend, whether it's to work on profici proficiency-based activities, learn how to teach students to write better, speak better, what have you. But we really do appreciate that opportunity. It just helps us to better to be better educators. The people that went this year, they came back with some new ideas that they learned about, and they shared them. And I actually use them in my classroom. So we're a team. We collaborate with one another. But those experiences for us, we value and appreciate. Down, we have the Foreign Language Week. We would like to bring that back. It's going to be March 3rd through the 9th. We just want to have all of our students appreciate the benefits of learning languages and how much fun they can have. We're going to have competitions in the classes, possibly show authentic movies, of course have food, you know. So that's something that we're looking forward to. And lastly, I just want to talk about the educators in our department. We work really hard within the classroom to provide our students with the best educational experience that they can have. But they also work hard outside of that. We have advisors. We have class advisors. We have advisors of the linguistics club and different clubs. We have people helping out with the radio station. And I just wanted to take the time to recognize that and all the contributions that they have for the school to help make it such a great school. Thank you. Thank you for that great presentation. And it's all the tech, all the things that are going on um, in the language department. It's it's uh, it's very important. I. I noted when it, reading a, a little novel and um, remembered my days uh, when I first went into college, freshman year, taking a foreign language and all of a sudden having to read a novel. I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, so it's, um, it's not, not easy and uh, to, to begin to like read in that language. Um, right. It's, uh, the whole novel and understand it. I have had enough time with English. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite an accomplishment, right? <laughs> when you do it. <laughs> Joan. Um, I'd like to commend you for everything that you're doing for the students and I can see why we have some high scores on the AP test. I mean one of the highest levels of Bloom's taxonomy is application and from your cuisine, drama, some of the screenplays that were done at Selman Pond Mall, I recognize that. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I recognize that. Uh, and from the novels and even doing the trivia. I mean, if the students get to apply it, they're going to keep it. And it's real life experiences that you're giving to them. So thank you very much. Because I think that's why the AP scores are higher. And I can see why there's a lot of interest to take the foreign languages. I have one question about the textbook that you mentioned. And can you mention the technology part? Mm -hmm. Is there some? the technology that they can use during the cl in the classroom. Is there any connection that they can use it at home? Are there any passwords or anything that if they want to continue or review that they can do it at home at their leisure? Absolutely. So they do. They have access to the textbooks and the resources. And they have 
items such as home tutors. So there's a little animated picture that comes up and they teach them all the different grammar concepts that they can access. They have flashcards and activities that they can use that focus on vocabulary, but they can access that in school and at home. That's wonderful. Yeah, Thank you. It's fantastic. That's... They have little videos. Oh, wow. They have audio activities. I mean, I can keep going. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really good. So how many, how many textbooks did, um, did you buy in the purchase? Many. Many? Um, for Spanish, we, we have levels one, two, and three. We have the bulk of our, that we bought was level two. Off the top of my head, um, anywhere between, I don't know, um, 200, 300? Okay. Or I, I, I'd have to look in that, but. That's fine, just a ballpark figure. And that's just for Spanish. And we also got to have, acquire books for French. And they have the same thing with the technology that they can use at home? Exactly. Fantastic. Yep, all through levels one through three. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we have the superintendent's report to committee. Uh, I think it's Dr. Walsh's Dr. opportunity to highlight Thank all you. that's great at Algonquin. Um, hopefully everyone had wonderful holidays. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to A.D. Masarino and World Language for um, being a part of our presentations for tonight. Some of the items are doubled up, so you'll see me skip over those so they don't um, continue the time. Uh, for academics, I wanted to speak about Stringorama. <coughs> It is a phenomenal event that's run in Southborough. The event was last night, so although the information is slightly um, outdated, I do want to speak to it. It's where you have a showcasing of that vertical alignment and development of children through music. And it's specifically, this is orchestra, but we do it a lot with band as well. The performance is in Southborough um, with the orchestra program, and it's hard to grasp the concept and the work and the vertical teaming and collaboration that happens across schools, across the music departments, until you actually hear it, until you're sitting there and listening and watching the children go from third grade, fourth grade, sixth and eighth and so forth, and then they all come together um, at the finale. So my family and I went last night to experience it. It was standing room only, standing gym only, trotty or gym. Um, it just speaks to the true testament of the community support. A lot of parents there, multiple schools there, kids showcasing what they learned. And as we all know about the learning process, music kind of crosses over between the right and left side of the brain. And so you can really use music to stimulate advancements in how students learn and how they relate to their academics. And to see that growth at such a young age and then just grow up to Algonquin is an exciting event. I know I'm going on and on about it. I wrote an email this morning to make sure that they all knew how much I appreciated what they did. It was the collaboration of not only the music teachers, the principals, the support, the parents, um, and again, it just speaks to how, how well our community comes out to support us. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. And if anybody recorded it, it is my son singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star off key in the beginning. <laughs> so, it's hard to make a three and a half year old understand, shh, but so we're there. Um, Nicole, Mr. Member uh, alluded to this a little bit. We have multiple peer-to-peer -peer tutoring going on in different content areas. You've heard me speak a little bit about it in the Algonquin Writing Center, where you match up a peer who has a strength in a certain area or skill, and they link up with a student who's looking for help. That is going on in science, that's going on in math, that's going on in world language, um, like I said, Algonquin Writing Center. That's powerful, when you can take a student who's struggling in some aspect of academics and allow them to get the support that they need in a comfortable setting, as well as a peer to practice application. So here's what I know grammatically. Here's how I can help you with your college essay. This is what I can do with your science lab report in you know, advanced biology, AP biology. And so when you start putting these peer-to-peer -peer programs in place in multiple levels and in multiple content areas, you build the student's skill levels at different areas and start closing some achievement gaps that some of our students might be experiencing. So I wanted to reiterate, I know um, Mr. Member spoke to it, but it's going on in multiple content areas. And then if you can't find the help that, you, that you're looking for, like I said, the college essay, you can bop down to the Algonquin Writing Center, and then they stop and do that. They are doing um, stop, drop, and midterm support. I believe it was today, and it filled up so fast that they had to open another session for Friday. So it really speaks to the support that we have going on in peer-to-peer -to -peer tutoring and positive connections. It's one more positive connection 
that our students can make with each other to foster that Algonquin community. So I just wanted to speak to that. Um, under our activities and clubs, we have been very busy per our norm. Almost a perfect score, again, out of our math leagues, uh, Algonquin's math league team, 29 out of 30. Our DECA program has had multiple competitions. They hosted the Young Professionals Entrepreneurial Night. 18 business professionals came into Algonquin. They worked with our, our students. They answered a lot of questions. There's some great panel questions. Um, Ms. Riley does phenomenal work with this. In addition to that, we've continued to grow our DECA Life Skills program. They also went to a recent competition. Shout out to Ms. Allen, who I think is in the audience, and um, our, the new administrator of student support, um, Ms. Cameron, both went and they were judges. Students performed excellent. They continue to practice their, their skills through multiple projects that they've done. You heard me speak about the ornaments that they made. They cross-collaborated against with different departments. They had a marketing strategy. They had a sales strategy. Um, they're going to continue that work. So we built DECA up, and now we're growing that DECA life skill. So really giving all children the same opportunities to apply the knowledge that they get in Algonquin outside of Algonquin's walls. Um, I have to just come back to the winter ball. Major success. Huge success again this year. We had quite a um, couple hundred, you know, like to pack them in there, at Mechanics Hall. And when you speak to our freshman class, it is just positive in that they had another opportunity to interact with peers outside of, you know, Algonquin School Day, foster those positive memories, and really just enjoy it. So I'm really glad that we brought back Winter Ball last year and that it continued again into this year. I know it seems like a dance, but it, it's a great opportunity for students to work on social skills. So. Not, not my taste in music, but it ain't, you know. <laughs> everybody was flossing, having a good time. Um, athletics, uh, A.D. Mastorino, I, I, I can't top that report. Um, to speak briefly of the T-Hawks of the month, they are there. We have our December T-Hawks. We have Lizzie, Ray, Karen, Gabriella. Um, just wanted to make sure that they got their, their recognition for their great work. Um, and also, Coach Fedak does this wonderful work on developing leadership skills with her, with her athletes. She brought five um, swim athletes with her to participate in the MIA, MIAA High School Captain's Workshop. It really mirrors the work that you see Mike doing and Fran you know, did last year on developing our student athletes to understand the impact that they have. You know, we mentioned you know, modeling. Uh, does really well, understanding that role as a peer leader, understanding the role you have as a student athlete in school. And to, to see Coach Fedak take what she does, you know, in the pool and bring it outside of that to her life skills just speaks to the true testament of the quality of coaches that we have. We have a coach here tonight. I think we have tennis coaches here, some in the audience as well. Shout out to Coach Doyle. Um, but, and, and, you know, A.D. Mustering has spoke about this as well. When you can have that coach here in the building fostering those positive relationships and then helping children apply that skill set outside of the um, typical school day, it just shows how much we invest in our children and how successful that it makes us here at Algonquin. Um, under department updates, I'm going to skip down to fine arts. If, you know, anyone has time, our students have displayed some recent artwork under, on our C200 hallway. Um, I know our gallery is preparing for their gallery opening. It's coming up soon. They're working on that. What's, what's exciting and why I mention it is that it gives children, one, to showcase something that they love, right, something that they're passionate about. But two, it gives a peer an opportunity to say, hey, good job, really like what you did. You know, give those positive accolades to one another, which helps foster a positive um, environment. On the bottom, I kind of squished and snipped and stuck it in there, but I wanted to show how many of our graduates had come back and joined in, in our holiday concert to do the finale of White Christmas. Um, our graduates come back. You know, Mr. Greenwald was here, graduate of Algonquin, Spanish teacher. Uh, speaks to, you know, just the traditions and the quality of academics that we offer here at Algonquin. <coughs> On the next page, um, under Applied Arts. This is a great one to read. It's interesting to see how um, Applied Arts and Technology does a lot in the business field, um, a lot of, of career path work. They have to stay extremely relevant and up-to-date in their curriculum. And some of the really fun ideas that they're exploring next year and how to modify and update their curriculum, like application of social media and marketing, but with that responsibility of how you use social media and what you do with it and how lasting it is. So they're thinking about, you know, not only the marketing opportunities and the opportunities that they can create within the class and the curriculum, but also how to give them those real life skills. You know, when you're in that interview and they Google your name, what's gonna happen on your Facebook account? <laughs> uh, Miss Muse 
She's doing the same exact thing with childhood development and some of the new research that's happen happening. Um, and Ms. Geigich is doing the same thing with our colony curriculum. So it's really exciting. They work in a professional learning community during the day when their community work meets. They use their department meetings and they use their own time after school to continue that collaborative work to advance our curriculum. Guidance, we have a very exciting community opportunity on January 31st at 7 p.m. Dr. Pote is coming here. She's gonna talk about adolescent brain development and how that impacts the choices our children make, how it goes about impacting some of the risk-taking activities that they may participate in. Dr. Pote recently spoke, I believe at St. John's um, earlier this year, and the community was great in informing us of how well-received she was and asked if she could speak at Algonquin. And through the collaboration of um, Southboro Youth and Family, APTO, Northboro Southboro Substance Coalition, um, and Guidance, we're able to bring that to fruition this month. So please share the word. It goes out in the one call. It's gonna be a great event. It's open to all community members. You do not have to be an Algonquin parent. Um, I've already shared it with the middle school so they can also get the information out, post it up on multiple calendars and websites. Just if, if you get the chance to share it out, because it was asked for and we were able to bring it here and it's exciting. Um, in addition to that, we are hosting our um, Wednesday, January 30th. We do our juniors and their parents. College admissions panel will come in and answer all those questions as we do our college planning. That's in conjunction. A lot of work that we're doing with guidance is aligning the conversations we have with our kiddos with the conversations we have with our parents. So you're going to see those junior workshops going on throughout these next couple weeks and then also that backup parent student meeting so that they can have those questions happening at the same time. Going down to student support and ESL, um, I, it, this is not in there. This is news, this is breaking news. We were able to um, host Best Buddies is hosting this Sunday. It's a long weekend, there's plenty of times before the game. Totally fit it in. At one o'clock and at four o'clock, Best Buddies is hosting, marketing, supporting, and running a dance performance here in which students are participating in it, either as singers or dancers and or you know doing the concessions doing the money collection um, and practicing skills application any threat of mr winter it will be moved to that monday on the holiday so we'll find a way to make it work um, again just very exciting to see how community support came in together gave our bus buddies the opportunity and they were able to market it and push it forward on the last page poetry out loud is back it's that time of year it started, competition is up and running, kids are writing their poems, they're getting ready. The final competition is uh, Tuesday, February 5th, <coughs> mark the calendars. It's, all, it's always fun. They do record it. Um, uh, Northboro Cable Access posts it for us, so if you ever wanted to see it, to see the students and the passions they have for the work that they do, great competition. Thank you to Ms. Franz, uh, newer teacher, second year in the building, and Mr. Zarnecki, you've heard that name before, he's our Algonquin Writing Center and Writing Across the Curriculum Liaison. So that is a um, shortened version because Mike stole some of my thunder, but he should have, so kudos to him. But hopefully I've done a good wrap up on some of the great work we've done. And in all of that, we had some multiple holidays and a vacation and we still pulled it off. So <laughs> it's often stays busy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to <clears throat> comment on the string of I'm glad you mentioned that. I was able to go to that years ago. My daughter was probably in fourth or fifth grade. And it was phenomenal. I mean, just to see the progression from one grade to the next. And then <clears throat> the one that I went to, there was actually the kid um, from the high school who was in the orchestra, and he was also a football player. And he got up and spoke about, you know, how it is possible to do both. And uh, he was very well spoken. And, and the whole time, it was, it was just great. So I'm glad to see that's back, and I hope they keep it going. Mm -hmm. Dan? So thank you. That was excellent. And uh, so the um, so when Dr. Pody is is coming on the 31st at 7 p.m. Is that going to be here at the school? In the auditorium, correct. Okay. Um, and is that ever done? You know, as a, a school assembly, do you ever have those kind of speakers come and speak to the students so you know that the students are getting the message as opposed to the ones whose parents may bring them that evening? Yes, it is, but it's grade specific. So we've had some speakers already this year where it's great specific and then we'll offer the speaker again at night. With Dr. Pote, no, we have the one opportunity at night. Okay. To the extent you can have, you can find those opportunities to have them. I understand grade specific, that's good, you know, but if there's, again, I encourage you to try to look for opportunities where the kids can hear it during the school day at an assembly and, and then, you know, I, I just I have a fear that the, the kids that maybe 
there's kids that who could benefit from this who aren't going to come January 31st at 7 p.m. And anyway, if you can look into that, that'd be great. Thank you. I was going to say the same thing. I think it's great to have it for parents. I don't think that parents can communicate to their kids as a speaker can, t can communicate to the kids. The kids need to hear it firsthand. They're not going to necessarily listen to their parents. And you, the parents can say their kid's not doing it. And I can guarantee that they are doing something. Maybe not, but <laughs> most are. <laughs> <laughs> most are. You know, and it's just, I think it's very important in today's society and everything that's going on with the vaping and stuff that this needs to be drilled into kids now. You know, so I would like to see more for parents, more for kids. The same point, like in years past, they used to, you know, before the prom, they'd throw some totaled car from a car accident mm -hmm. and just force everybody to have to walk by it to, you know, to kind of talk about drinking and driving before the, you know, before a prom or graduation week or something. It's, the more you can expose them to it, you know, some of it's got to sink in. You, you, you pray some of it sinks in. So, um, I feel like in the past, uh, there have been creative teachers that have actually done stuff like given extra credit if, and especially for the psychology, sociology, those kind of classes, if the student attends, you know, like whatever the session was. But this would probably be a really great, so to the extent that, I, I'm not an educator, so I don't know if this is something illegal. <laughs> but um, if it's just an extra credit thing, I would think that, you know, teachers should probably do what they can to, you know, to, mm -hmm. to influence the kids, that this would be a good message to hear. And it's a good push for me to, to bring back, like for our health classes, right. like you said, psychology, biology, yep. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. I like Kathleen's idea. I think even to make it a homework assignment, mm -hmm. just an attendance <laughs> that you're there, right. you know what I mean? And it could lead to further uh, discussion in the classroom even afterwards or with parents. I mean, no matter what we can save, if we can save one child, we can save five, we save 10. And it's worthwhile. So I agree with all the other previous members that have mentioned that, that it would be nice to have it during the day for the kids. Yeah, I know in the past, um, we've, they, they used to have a time, and I'm sure it has to do with the availability of the speaker. And as I know, um, I've actually drive by, and you know they'll have a program that was put on by you know, some speaker a couple of times a year and that piggybacked it with the parents. So, um, you know, you guys do a great job of um, trying to offer it during the day when you, when you um, speak of the day. <laughs> so, um, thank you uh, for the update. So I just have to say before we get to enrollment that there have been a lot of conversations on how to communicate to the folks at town meeting all of what takes place at the high school and our schools. And I think I'm just going to take Sarah's principal reports and <laughs> find them <laughs> along with the public hearing documents and all of the other budget documents that we distribute mm -hmm. because there's no better way to bring to life numbers than to see the pictures and and read the words uh, that are presented in the reports by Sarah and by the other principals in their weekly reports to the community, that that really brings the day-to-day -day life in the school um, alive, mm -hmm. comes alive. And I'm going to be talking about numbers, which are less than exciting, but without those, no I'm excited about the numbers. <laughs> yes, it's a matter of perspective, but I think those numbers really do support all of what has been presented this evening in the report and what takes place at school, and so they're a vital part of the, the process. On that note, I actually think that it would be actually mm -hmm. a good idea to put mm -hmm. this on a table at Southboro for town meeting. I was serious, yeah. Kathy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have all those things. I mean, they have all the, the handouts. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's right. kind of great to read while you're sitting there listening yeah. to the same person. <laughs> 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 Something you don't yeah. So we have a binding think, machine with a snappy cover. Algonquin comes alive. I think it would be fantastic to show yeah. people exactly what goes on here. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, you can put your budget report on it too. Do something mm -hmm. to, you know, 
talk about what goes on here. Yeah. yeah. And we, going. we have, right. you know, those kinds of reports on a regular sure. basis from the principals that are sent home. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we've done that before, but it would be nice to put, you know, Algon North or South or Regional K-8. Even for like parents whose kids are in middle school. Right. Yeah. right. To yeah. read about this to see what goes on in the high school would be good too. Yeah. And as our eighth graders are moving on to high school, what's mm -hmm. more exciting than to see kids have, you know, students enjoying their time at school. Mm -hmm. right. yes. so gives them something to look forward to. Maybe some of the metrics, maybe a page or two on metrics on, on some of the standardized testing or something wouldn't be a bad thing. To, mm -hmm. You know, or a list of all the colleges that you know, we've we've received acceptances from okay. in the last year or something. I mean, that's always just impressive. Some positive so. feedback to help mm -hmm. with the, yeah. So we are doing the budget books again that we put out last year, and it did have you know that important information that people want to see. But pictures are worth a thousand words, and mm -hmm. um, or twenty-four million as that budget would be. <laughs> and so putting those together might be just the thing to do. So I will be um, reaching out to the high school to, to make some sort of visual presentation and infusing that in our budget book that we already bind and put out for parents and uh, might make an exciting read during town meeting. Uh, and just one last comment. I'd like to thank Sarah for attending these events. I think in every monthly uh, principal's report, you always mention about attending an event, but I know there's more than you attend, even with your family. And I know that even their high school kids, they probably still love seeing their principal being there and even making the connection to you and to your kids. So, And it's a worthwhile educational experience for your kids. But thank you for attending these events, which I think is very important to have your your beautiful face and, and voice and support for the kids there. Thank you very much. And now, the exciting, all of those students that represent all this good work. Uh, what you have in your packet is actually um, an outcropping of last night's uh, budget subcommittee meeting. We do generally um, share the projected numbers a little later, uh, but um, based on our conversations last, year, last night about enrollments, uh, they're included in an updated enrollment uh, which was distributed in your packet. So you will see the current enrollments for 2018-19, what, what our numbers were as of October 1, uh, with little fluctuation actually since October 1, which is what the state bases most of its data points on. And then uh, the projected enrollments for 1920. Um, being mindful that that footnote is important, that number represents 100% of our current eighth graders moving on. Historically, um, it is close to that, uh, but that is um, our best hope that everyone who's currently in our system moves on to the high school. So that's what we're looking at uh, right now with projected 100% of our eighth graders moving on. So that information is very helpful as we consider our budget for next year. I don't know if the committee has any questions on that. We have about four versions of enrollments that we distributed, I think, early on this year, one using census numbers, another using NESDEC, and some projected amount of um, enrollment from Southboro and Northboro based on a five-year average. And the five-year average is somewhere about around 87% from Southboro and about 95% from Northboro. But it fluctuates from year to year. Also in your packet this evening is the um, general fund expenditure report. I uh, would request a vote to approve until audited this evening. Um, again, um, attached to the monthly general, uh, general report is also the status of our athletic revolving account for review. Uh, again, Mike did a, an excellent job presenting this evening. Thank you. And is also doing a very excellent job being mindful of his expenditures and reviewing that process. So thank you. Well. So I move that we vote to approve until audited the monthly general fund expenditure report as of December 31st and the revenue report as of Thank December you. 31st. Second. Moved by Paul, sec uh, seconded by Dan. All those I have a question if, I, if I could on the, on the revenue report. Um, as of December 31st, it shows that we've got 56% of the $350,000 estimated athletic receipts in place and, and kind of thinking after December 31st, the number, of, the number of games that we have that are revenue generating, ticket selling, kind of drops off a bit. I mean, we're just down to basketball, right? And, and we're already, by December 31st, we're already through some of the basketball season, I think. Are we gonna hit that number? Are we gonna hit that $350,000? 
that you that I asked, Mike? I mean, well, we are, in regards to uh, our expenditures for this year, we are above where we're at for our ticket prices for basketball. Um, and we've only had one hockey game so far. Um, so we're, we're above that. And okay. with, and also with the amount of participants that we have above from last year with our, with our fees, we are, we are on target for that. Okay, terrific. And anecdotally, we're about the same percentage as we were last as year. As we were last okay. year at this time. And All we I need to hear. Thank above. you very much. Yep. Done. Okay. <clears throat> All those in favor? That's unanimous. The priorities in the calendar we're going to be revisiting. Um, just as a side note, we do not have any particular dates set yet by um, financial advisory or in Southborough or Northborough appropriations for the presentations, but we do know that Southborough's Town meeting um, is sooner than uh, later this year, so we'll be looking at um, March 23rd and for that town meeting uh, on a Saturday and April 22nd. Um, I'm anticipating receiving a phone call from either John Cadere or Mark Purple shortly to um, very soon to indicate what those dates might be for our meetings. Uh, and certainly we'll let the committee know when that happens. Capital plan is also in your packet. Uh, vote to approve. Uh, we did not approve it when it was presented, I believe, in uh, November. I think it was the November meeting. Um, I will make a notation that Mike, since Mike is here at our meeting last month, we did discuss the fact that there was a, um, a group of very active, positive community members uh, that wanted to work with us to explore um, creating an RFP and funding that process to examine uh, the feasibility of a multi-sport um, complex upgrade. And that whole center part of this capital plan is really dependent on some of that work. Uh, there are a number of uh, proposed upgrades to various pieces of our athletic complex. And um, it is certainly our hope that um, we can move on this and um, activate those community members and members of the booster organization who are um, very enthusiastic about working with us to launch an RFP so that we can have some design work completed to um, take a look at what that would look like in terms of cost, but also in the overall des uh, layout and design of all these upgrades. If that were to take place, and, and I see at this point, based on conversations, why it wouldn't, that entire middle section of the capital plan would be part of that discussion. And that represents a big portion of it. And then the next phase of, would be proposed funding avenues for supporting that work. Okay. So do you want a motion? Yep. So uh, I move that we approve the Algonquin proposed capital budget for FY 2019 Thanks. through FY 2024 as provided. Second. Moved by Paul, seconded by Dan. Any discussion? So just, well, you know, for clarification for everyone, I mean, if we okay this, that doesn't necessarily mean right. that in FY21 we're now obligated to spend that money. We won't mm -hmm. be signing contracts to, you know, for... I would like to thank Mike Gorman, who works um, and spends much time analyzing these numbers to put these to paper and does, as we know, a phenomenal job keeping this facility as if it were brand new. So we appreciate uh, all the work for, that Mike uh, puts into caring for this complex, as well as um, our maintenance and custodial crews. Well, I actually need, I wanted to add something to that. Uh, um, someone had mentioned to me who had, their kids went to uh, another area high school, regional school, and um, they were so impressed with how uh, clean this school was and kept and maintained and they're like you know she, she was just um, flabbergasted you know what she was used to mm -hmm. with, um, and it was a well-to-do community re regional district so um, they do a great job I also think it speaks to the the culture and the climate and just our overall attitude of our students being appreciative of the experience that they have here each and every day and wanting to keep their school um, in great shape, and our teachers as well, and administrators. Okay, so um, all those in favor? That passes unanimously. So now we have the one way.
We do. And before I approach the podium, I do want to draw your attention to a couple documents that uh, were distributed. Uh, we have met as a budget subcommittee twice. Uh, the preliminary budget that you see is sort of the second preliminary discussion that we've had. And uh, we met as early, um, as late as last evening, actually, and um, went through the entire budget, um, basically fund code by fund code. What you also have in your packet, uh, this is a fairly um, lengthy line item budget that you have uh, as part of the preliminary conversation. And with each fund code, which is a classification or a category, there are many subcategories within each code. What you have is a synopsis of the status of each of the fund codes with the description from 19 to 20 and what the dollar difference is represented in this budget. So it's a little bit of a snapshot version of the entire um, line item budget. And with that, I'd like to um, just share a PowerPoint. Before I begin, I, I, this is on, right? uh, before I begin, I would like to just um, give a, a number of thank yous to the folks who participate in the process of building any budget, whether it's the North or South or Regional School District budget or um, any budget of such magnitude. And that really is um, central office, um, the building base team here at Algonquin Regional, led by um, Principal Walsh. and. Um, all those who input at every level uh, to represent uh, their needs and to share their needs um, as we think about starting our next um, school year, FY 2020. The process uh, begins really as soon as we start expending the budget in July 1. So the team at Central Office has worked um, together to um, sort of uh, fine tune each and every line item in this budget and what we heard tonight is well represented um, in many of our conversations. It's so exciting to think that the budget that we present each and every year supports the good work that um, you know World Language presented this evening, but each and every time one of our departments are, are invited to present, we learn a little bit more about the school and we learn uh, more and more from a, an actual application point perspective how this budget is realized um, each and every day at the high school. There have been in a number of conversations with um, our two member towns uh, to identify the current uh, fiscal realities that they deal with each and every day. As a regional district, we have a unique funding opportunity um, to join um, not only fiscally, but with our, our student populations in our communities to create such an outstanding educational experience for our students. The budget that is uh, presented this evening, again, is based very much on our statement of vision and mission, um, as well as um, the budget priorities that are created at the onset of each fiscal year. I think this year they were voted in October. So this is where we begin. It is our foundation, it is at the core of all of our conversations, and it is very much a part of all of the documents that are communicated throughout the year in various formats. The budget process, as I mentioned, uh, begins with a, re a review here at school committee and um, a revision of any budget priorities that um, <coughs> were established last year and will help guide our work next year. Throughout the months leading up to this evening, uh, there have been many meetings and many conversations that have taken place. And part of those conversations center around the priorities that were voted by the school committee in the early fall. I think it is clear that as we begin our conversations with any budget, we review these budget priorities and ask ourselves as we're moving through this process, are we being true to the priorities that were established? Uh, a good example of the first bullet or the first priority was to maintain high quality staff outstanding presentation from world language and also to ensure that 
they in their work and our students in their learning have the instructional programming and resources um, available and accessible to them. Nicole mentioned several times new textbooks. All of our textbooks have um, online options as a priority when purchasing them. But that was realized because five years ago, the school committee uh, was in full support of funding, even through challenging times, a five-year plan of uh, resource allocation. It had been some time since we were investing in textbooks, and we were a little bit behind. We knew that we could not purchase all of those materials in any given year. So with great conversations here by the, with the high school administration and the departments, they sort of, I, I, I referred to it as the deli line serving next number, but that's really what it was. And through great conversations, they decided which department would go next. And because of that, and because we adhered to that through the process, the students realized new resources and um, the content comes alive. We have reauthored that document, and Sarah, with her departments, has created the next five years uh, based on that uh, successful endeavor. So it was requested that you know the department chairs come back together, look at where they are now, uh, look backwards in terms of what we were able to provide to them and then do some forward thinking. So that document is um, available to us and we use that to take a look at our needs this year as we planned um, for next year in the budget. So that's reflected in the budget. Always uh, strive to achieve class sizes according to our policy and earlier this year um, when Sarah presented her school improvement plan, the discussion around class sizes was um, a key discussion and so that's something that we're mi very mindful of as we move forward with the process. Prepare all students for high levels of success in college and career readiness. Part of the instruction, uh, the infrastructure upgrades that support our bring your own device, which is the fourth, uh, fifth bullet down, yes, um, also helps us prepare our students for the online version of MCAS, which for the high school is its first year of launch. We've been online at the K-8 level, uh, but this is in fact the final frontier for that MCAS rollout and uh, we are well prepared for that, as, a, as well as all the work that the guidance uh, department and all of the teachers do in their classrooms to bring uh, career pathways alive, again, represented in Sarah's uh, presentation this evening. So when we talk about maintaining a budget, all of these considerations are in play. We want to maintain the experiences that the students have now and in all possible cases not look at reducing when in any line item uh, but certainly being mindful of the priorities um, in place Sarah presented her school improvement plan and this budget I think does continue <coughs> to support some of the items that she had in her action plan Sarah can speak to this uh, dr. Walsh can speak to this more directly but just to do some give some overarching examples I think um, she shared a little bit about the speakers that are present whether they're here for the evening uh, for our parents and students or throughout the day for our students. One of the um, increases, uh, which was offset, but it's still in the budget, was um, some additional funding for those speakers and not always relying on um, external funding through APTOs and so forth because they are essential in the overall social, emotional well-being and, and health of our students and having guest speakers in uh, does support that. Also, uh, there were some discussions around continuing your great work with the department chairs around professional learning communities, as well as continuing to look at our instructional practices through our instructional rounds. This budget, while may not so, uh, be uh, associated specifically with a high school or building baseline item, does continue to provide some curriculum R&D funds that allow us to support those launches on a district-wide basis. Julie Doyle is here. Our Director of Instructional Technology Learning, Literacy Learning. Close, right, Julie? Uh, and she can speak a little bit uh, about that blended learning, blended one-to-one -one learning environment that uh, we launched and this year as a pilot, but that also supports the Canvas Learning Management System that we've talked about quite frequently uh, throughout the year. Um, so Julie, I'm actually gonna share the mic with you in this presentation if you want to say a few words yeah come on up Julie Doyle come on down 
You're the next presenter on right. FY 2020 budget. Hello. Um, so um, as Christine mentioned, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the technology budget and, and what it is that we have in store with the, with the money that we've decided to include in that budget. Um, so according to uh, the district technology implementation plan, we have always had as a goal to provide access, um, to provide student access to technology to support 21st century learning. Um, over the last couple of years, a lot of the budget money has been devoted to buying some devices, but also to fund some major infrastructure, network infrastructure projects. And we feel like that was really necessary to lay the groundwork to move the high school away from shared carts to this most recent year of our BYOD, or Bring Your Own Device Initiative, and now moving forward to what we are referring to as our blended one-to-one -one initiative. So it, there was a document that was shared with you. And as you can see from that document, the upgrade to the infrastructure was completed in September. Um, then at the beginning of term two, which was early November, we encouraged students to bring in their own device. We recommended devices that we thought that they should bring in. We had also noticed over the last couple of years that there was sort of a, this unofficial bring your own device happening with you know somewhere around you know, 30 to 50 percent of our students. Um, also this year, what we had in place, if families decided not to send a device in with their student, we had devices available in the library, Chromebooks specifically, that the students could loan out on a, um, on a daily basis. Um, as Christine also mentioned, with um, the implementation of Canvas uh, in year two, the combination of um, bring your own device and our learning management system has really made technology integration more seamless, as well as provided for uh, more personalized and blended learning opportunities. So what we noticed this year was students are bringing in their devices. And only about 7% 7, 7 of the student population were borrowing devices on a, on a daily basis. Um, so we've met and sort of reevaluated the program. And, and what we've included in the FY20 budget is the decision to purchase 120 more Chromebooks. And the, all the numbers are sort of outlined for you in that, on that document. But what this will do will be to um, increase our current inventory and really put us in a good place to make sure there's equity and providing all students who need a device, a device. Because we feel like that 7% might not be representative of all the students who need a device because um, we, we think it maybe makes sense to be able to give the devices to students to, to borrow for the whole year instead of having to loan on a daily basis. And our, our plan moving forward is to um, continue to reevaluate and to, to develop the budget that would include funding to buy more Chromebooks based on need, usage, and the age of the Chromebooks in our current inventory. Well, OK, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's also, I think, important to note that when we say we're going to purchase 30 additional Chromebooks, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're adding to the technology line items. And I think that's a po an important point to um, emphasize, that in reality, what we're doing is reallocating what we expended those funds on last year. I remember when we were putting the budget together last year, we noted that this was sort of the one last chance we had to capitalize on a lot of E-rate funding that was coming our way. And so we chose to increase that line item so that we could maximize the E-rate reimbursement or the offset. And we did that. And so even though we're purchasing 30 more Chromebooks in this operational budget, it's not 30 more, uh, 120 more Chromebooks or $30,000 increase. We are reallocating those um, funding resources that are contained in the budget. And that is often our discussion. When we suggest that we need more of, it doesn't necessarily mean we're adding to the budget. It means we're redistributing the funds that are already contained in the budget. Um, and also the last one we just reviewed, our uh, long and short term capital plan. That capital plan is our best uh, case design at what we would like to see accomplished, as Mr. Butker um, pointed out. But we're not always able to realize everything on that capital plan. The impacts this year, again, it's 
many people refer to it as a, a level service budget. I refer to it as maintaining what we have and in certain areas having some um, incremental growth in areas that we focus on. This year, um, we do note that we have an increase in budgeted expenditures to meet an increase in student needs. That's a targeted area of incremental growth. We are um, completing next year our third year of our collective bargaining agreement. And as we know, we are a human resource rich industry. And therefore, every year, the largest percentage of our budget is allocated to staffing and related costs. Uh, and this year, again, it, next year will be the last year of our current collective bargaining agreement. Julie mentioned that we had invested in the technology infrastructure, allowing us then to have successful pilots like Canvas and uh, the blended one-to-one -one, uh, learning initiative or learning environment. And so the, the um, purchase of those devices does represent an incremental growth because we're purchasing another 120 Chromebooks, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's an increase to the budget. It's really a redistribution of budgeted funds. We are, as I mentioned earlier, maintaining our learning resource allocation um, five-year plan, and that has been reauthorized this budget does reflect fulfillment of the fifth year. Hard to believe it's been five, but it has, um, which necessarily doesn't mean that we've increased those line items. It means what we've done is increased in the areas of need, and that's reflected in this budget as well. And we are completing our fifth year of our transportation contract next year. And so there's a slight increase per the contract in the budget. I think it's about $17,000 uh, because of the fifth year of the contract. We do have some offsets. It's not always add. We do have some offsets to the budget last year because of the um, good work of school committees from across the Commonwealth and um, MASC and MASS um, being relentlessly in pursuit of additional funding for Circuit Breaker with uh, the governor and the state. We were able to realize a growth from somewhere between 65, 68% to 72%. That's reflected in our <coughs> Um, offset our reimbursement rate in circuit breaker. Again, we are very fortunate as a district. Unlike many districts, we bank what we receive in this year and budget to expend next year. So the monies we're receiving this year from circuit breaker are actually based on FY18 uh, students. So uh, we know that we will have $512,112 to offset the $1,366,495 cost for out of district placements. I do have to suggest that while that number seems high, um, it is very much offset by the great programming that takes place in our high school. And what isn't always visible in a budget like this when you're looking at what's expended is what you save by the programs that we invest in each and every day and the work that our teachers do and our staff uh, to keep our students in our district. So I think that's always worth noting. So in this operational uh, budget, FY20, we are budgeting the difference between the two and that is an increase in the student out of district um, line item. We also, yay, had an increase in regional transportation, which coincidentally, we were on a 71-72 at the state level last year. Um, is resulting in a $717,792 offset to the increase. Uh, that number is coupled with Chapter 70 to reduce the amount of um, assessments to our towns. Last year, a lot of great work with um, our Teachers Association and working with our towns to once again address the ever-increasing uh, rising costs related to health care. As a regional district, we contain those costs within our budget. Last year, uh, with lots of discussion, we consolidated to one carrier. There is an increase in the budget. That has more to do with subscribership than overall cost on the uh, health care plan. This is the first year we're seeing just about a 0% increase for active employers employees and about a two to three percent increase for retirees. So the numbers in the budget reflect subscribership, but it also reflects um, a minimal co cost increase because of the actual cost of the plan. If we can remember year after year, 
uh, one of the things that we always talked about at the preliminary budget stage was we don't know what health care is going to be. In some years, we talked about a 10 to a 12 percent increase. Last year, uh, I think the increase came in around 4 or 5 percent. So to be here saying 0 percent, again, um, kudos to the associations for being willing and open to these kinds of conversations. Uh, we are uh, continuing to, with our class size projections, align our FTEs, which is full-time teacher equivalency, um, with our class size analysis. That conversation uh, will continue uh, all the way through a request to vote on the recommended budget, which will be February 27th. And then um, Mike referred to the revenues as offsets for our athletic, um, to support our athletic program. The cost of our athletic program is 889,426. 536,950 is represented in the operational budget, and that is offset by an anticipated uh, revenue gate receipts fees of $352,476. So those are some offsets that actually um, help move our budget forward. The preliminary regional budget proposed at this point with a very, very strong emphasis on preliminary. Unlike perhaps a K-8 budget, we are most affected by what the state decides to do. And the state has not issued the governor's budget. We also know that the issuance of the budget in January really doesn't mean all that much because we, in August, are always voting new assessments because the budget just gets approved in July. So it goes through its process at the State House. At this point, this is our preliminary proposal. Um, I anticipate between now and February 27th, when we're back looking at um, voting a recommended budget, that that number will be adjusted. It won't adjust up, but it will most likely be adjusted. So we're looking at um, this year's budget, $23,082,958, a preliminary increase, $952,194 for a very preliminary budget proposal of $24,035,152, an incremental increase of 4.13. How does that break down to us, to our members? The regional budget calculation, um, is as follows. We look at our preliminary budget amount and we subtract from that what we know we're going to be receiving from the state. While there's been a lot of conversation about an increase in Chapter 70, uh, it hasn't been realized at this point. Uh, so based on what we received last year, $3,123,514. There's the regional transportation reimbursement, which helps bring that total down as we move towards the assessment. We have miscellaneous income of about $20,000 each year uh, because of all the member accounts that we have. Christine Tegg does an amazing job at investing our accounts, and that totals $3,861,306, which means that after our offset, offsets moving forward to, um, again, calculating assessments to our town, we're looking at a remaining balance of $20,173,846. I will say that this year, working with um, our two towns, Mark Purple, Brian Ballantyne, John Kadir, and Kim Foster Hood, we have spent an enormous amount of time trying to figure out what the MLC numbers might be in advance of the governor's budget. Historically, when we've talked preliminary budget, we've used the prior year's MLC numbers. This year, uh, working with Jim and Greg and the two towns with the uh, Mars Association and the state, we have dug very deeply into the MLC calculations. Still can't explain it. Still very confusing. But we've put a lot of time into trying to figure out if we can get closer to an estimate of those governor's numbers. When those numbers are shared, uh, it can be a significant impact to our towns because those numbers affect how much the state is telling each town they can afford to pay at a minimum. So these are adjusted numbers 
we're very much looking forward to the governor's release because if we get close to these, we may actually have developed a formula working with all of these folks at the state level and local level to help calculate this, these numbers, which is a big help to the towns. Um, after those minimum local contribution amounts, which we actually have nothing to do with, we do not set them, we just inherit them, the remaining budget to be allocated based on October 1 enrollments, $6,541,737. Because we are a regional district, the towns are assessed by regional agreement uh, based on the October 1 numbers. We just took a look at them again tonight. There was a slight shift this year percentage-wise. Northboro's portion of those numbers is 61.77%. Southboro's portion based on enrollment is 38.23%. Once we apportion that six million plus dollars accordingly and add the minimum local contribution, we see what it is that each town will be um, asked to support in terms of dollars. And from that, we look at what is the increase in percentage and aggregate dollars over last year. So at this point, the assessment um, is, uh, 7.26 for Northboro or $820,300. Um, no debt included in that, just budget and operational budget and Southboro's portion is an increase of $414,891 or 5.43%. Just some historical percentages. We can see, this is the enrollment percentages and the, um, Shifting from year to year, from the prior slide, we see how that could potentially impact the assessments to our towns. Moving forward again, historical reflection. Uh, 1449, note there's an asterisk next to that. When we prepare the budget, we look at our October 1 enrollments and that's what we use for the calculations of enrollment. However, we know that we've just um, taken a look at what our projections are for next year. If those numbers come to fruition, they will be used next year to calculate FY21's budget. Some interesting dis, uh, aggr disaggregation of dollars um, and why it's showing up category with names on them is perhaps because I moved the file over from <laughs> Google. Google. It's an interesting, you do all kinds of things. So. What you'd be looking at here is the largest part of that pie, which is contractual obligations, and um, that's a di disaggregation of our total dollars of $24,035,000. i am going to, because it doesn't even have it on my screen, you, I think you have the handout, which actually has the printouts of the categories. But that's a, a snapshot of a visual representation of the 24 million by fund code. And the percentage by categories are, are on the bottom. Let's hope these, uh, these did translate. So if we look at uh, FY percent <coughs> allocation of the total budget increase, regular ed and special ed, uh, this was an interesting slide as well. If we're looking at the total allocation just by fund codes, which isn't one particular line item, but an aggregate of all of uh, the special ed budget and all of the regular ed budget, 38% is uh, an overall increase of 367,553 for the regular ed, or 1.5% of the overall budget increase, and um, 2.56 for student support services and special education, um, again, reflecting the disaggregation of the 952-194. And one more slide. Um, we have the Dan Kalenda enrollment model. We have the Paul Butka <coughs> chart model. Uh, and that is what can we really affect in terms of discretionary funding. So if we look at this budget, con contractual obligations, which is about 35% contractual obligations. Uh, unless we have reductions in force, or decide not to support the third year of the contract, those numbers are basically fixed. As well as the insurance, uh, again, I noted that it was a 3% on retirees and a 0%. That insurance uh, really does speak to the actual subscriber rate of our um, employees. Out of district tuitions, we, there is no discretion 
Special Ed Director of Student Support Services is here this evening, Marie Allen, and her team does an amazing job to um, keep our students in district, uh, but sometimes uh, it, is, it is necessary for um, students to have an experience outside of our district. And below you'll see the other um, categories. We did say that this building is very, very well maintained and we very rarely increase our maintenance accounts. We try to work with them and use facilities rentals whenever possible. We have transportation regular ed. I mentioned there was a $17,000 increase. Uh, that is contractual. We have to pay our utilities, although it is getting a little chilly in here right now, but I, I know we have the um, insurance uh, because we are a district, a regional district, we have things like Medicaid and um, liability insurance that we maintain, where the town usually maintains that uh, on our K-8s. Transportation for special ed, again, if students are moving about within and without the outside of the district, we have to provide transportation. District costs are things like um, fiscal audits that we um, need to have completed. And technology, we mentioned a little bit about that. However, what's interesting about the technology accounts is there's very, very little increase, despite the fact that we just mentioned that we were going to purchase Chromebooks. What you can't see in between that blue and that other little um, orange slice is this tiny little strip that represents about a 1% of the, um, the total numbers reflected in this increase. So pulling out a piece of the pie that we actually might consider discretionary funds is our teaching and learning purchases in the budget which total about six percent thank you and that is the preliminary budget we actually do not have to take a vote on this budget this evening we don't generally vote for preliminary I certainly can answer questions uh, join this evening i would be amiss they came out for the night is uh, Jim Jocker, our appointed interim business manager, Marie Allen. Rebecca Pellegrino is in the back row. We see you. HR Director Julie was um, at the mic. And Rhoda Webb, our English yeah. language <laughs> educator, education coordinator. Thank you. Any, uh, Comments. Paul. So, uh, you know, I think we've done a terrific job of kind of keeping this as low as we can keep it while level setting, you know, the services that we've been providing, you know, for, for these years. I mean, we've got a great complex here. We are proud of what we do. We don't want to cut back on those services in any way. Um, and, and as we kind of saw in this last slide, I mean, you know, the $950,000 increase uh, is, is almost, what, 94% of it is almost unavoidable costs. Contractual requirements, you know, uh, adhering to, to legal requirements relative to, you know, support services for students, how the, you know, and then you know, how the money gets allocated to the towns is, you know, that minimum local contribution math is, is, is interesting, but. Uh, and, and it's kind of out of our control. But, you know, I think, you know, frankly, I think we've done everything we can. I think it is terrific that we've been able to incorporate the, that, what are we calling it, the blended one-for-one, one one, um, you know, Chromebook program and stuff, and to get that funded this year. I think it was a terrific addition to this budget uh, without without breaking the bank. And, and you know, the, the idea of, of being able to, to, lo to loan one to a, student who needs one instead of every day, you know, to just to be provisioned in a way that we can just say, okay, you know, if you need it, you know, here it is. And, oh, yeah, by the way, we'll have some others for the kids who forget their, their laptop for some reason, you know, walking in the door at any particular morning. I think, I think Julie and her team put together a terrific plan here. Um, you know, so even as we're trying to just level set you know we're still finding creative ways to keep improving things um, you know and, and I, I think we did it with the about as minimal an increase as could be done this year and, and I think Christine and, and Dr. Walsh and the staff are all to be commended here you know, it's, 
I, I, I can't see any way to do it any better and, and still deliver like we've been delivering. So, nice job. I'll second Mr. Budka's comments. I, I do like the motto, educationally sound and fiscally responsible. Ms. Johnson, I agree that uh, that's what this budget represents. Um, and I also think the one-to-one -one is, a, is, a, is a good idea. Um, I know there was a lot of, uh, there, you know, the bring your own device, and I don't like the acronym, um, so I don't use it, um, for what it also can yeah, bring your own beverage. <laughs> so I never like that. Never like that uh, in a, for a school environment. But um, I applaud the efforts to try to you know, be able to uh, allocate some of those devices to students who need them. I know there were. There, I have heard from many parents who didn't like it from the get-go because they didn't want their kids coming with uh, devices that were just going to take their attention away from school, and they're going to use them for social media purposes. And uh, so now that you know, now that they have to have one, I think, you know, the Chromebook idea is probably better than, you know, a smaller device that a student is just going to be using for social media, time and time again in school. So, uh, kudos on the on the blended one to one. I think that's a, a good idea. And again, well done, Ms. Johnson. Educationally sound and fiscally responsible. You you once again, you know, did a great job on behalf of our district. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so um, next uh, next month will be recommended B day. B day. <laughs> or B day. <laughs> and uh, budget day. Yeah. Budget day, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the um, March meeting, is that, that's before South Coast Town meeting? I think so. Yeah. It's the third Wednesday, so March 23rd would be the Saturday of the week we have our combined. Okay. Yeah. I think too that um, you know, in light of a lot of the conversations that are taking place in both the communities, uh, there was sort of about two years where uh, we would have budget presentations and, and actually we had great conversations with the custodians in the school that night. And so I think, uh, I feel very strongly that this year in particular, um, prior to the Southboro meeting in March and the April meeting in, in April, um, the Northboro meeting, we will be putting um, opportunities out there for groups, particularly our seniors, to meet with us and um, just have budget meetings uh, in both of the communities because of the conversations that might be taking place or the confusion around some of the initiatives like the blended one-to-one -one. we upgraded the bring to blended one-to-one uh, -one for that project and uh, really just to take the time to address any questions that we you know, that folks might have we'll be sharing those dates soon okay so um moving on we have no old business. We have no policy development or distribution. Um, audience sharing. Um, I do have something. We I uh, did hear from uh, Janetta Choi, our member. Um, she sent me a letter, uh, and it it is with uh, deep regret that I must inform you that I am resigning my position on the Regional School Committee effective January 1st, 2019. Sadly, due to personal reasons, I am unable to attend meetings, which makes it impossible to perform my duties as a committee member. It has been an honor to serve with such passionate, kind, and helpful people. I have learned so much, and thank you and everyone involved with the committee for this wonderful experience. Sincerely, Janetta Choi. So, um, we will be um, posting a in for the for the town of um, Northboro um, seeking seeking like we did before um, residents to put forth uh, an interest. So will be the timeline would be um, post on um, January 18th 
Friday. Friday. Mm -hmm. And they would be due by February 15th. And we'd interview at our next um, meeting on February 27th, as we did before. And so that'll that would go out and the uh, appointment is until the annual election in May of 2019 so just for the remainder of the year and get someone a good taste of the committee and get some new people so anyways I want to say I mean I enjoyed um, serving with Janetta when uh, she always had um, some good, good comments um, when she she didn't she didn't speak often, but when she did, she was um, always was on point. I thought and um, thought brought a fr fresh perspective to the committee that um, that I didn't always think of when when she would bring up a point or a question. So um, I wish her um, the best and hope for the future. Any other audience sharing? Joan. I would just like to also thank Janetta for her service as being a Northboro member on the Regional School Committee. I remember her enthusiasm when she first got on board and having little children and it's, mm -hmm. we all know how hard it is even with teenage children not to juggle <laughs> everything that we have to do. So, but I'd like to thank her for enthusiasm and maybe in the future we'll see her Again, running on a position for K to eight or even the region again. So, congrats! Um, thank her for her service. All right. So, we have um, personnel distribution. We just and um, the Worcester County Superintendents Association College Lunch Team was in fact. I just want to, if I might comment, uh, Jessica Lee and Andrew Zhao were our recipients this year. This is an annual event. Uh, Dr. Walsh and I get to attend this uh, event this year. It was um, at um, Holy Cross on the hill. We traveled to Holy Cross. And it's just amazing to um, sort of hear the resumes and the, and the bios of the students and so many wonderful community service and um, career pathways represented from our scholars, our recognized scholars. And it's something that the Superintendents Association in Worcester County has been sponsoring for many, many years. And it continues to be the highlight of, um, of the year. So it was a great day well spent, or morning. Lunch, I think it was lunch, actually. And it's also nice to be there with uh, our colleagues. Uh, we don't oftentimes have a chance to gather, so. It's a, it's a great time to recognize our students. And their pictures are in <coughs> color in the brochure and the packet. I always, always get this every year, and mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's quite an honor for the kids and, and um, a good opportunity to meet other students at other high schools as well that are um, equally as um, accomplished. And so next we have approval of bills and payrolls. So we'll have those. Not those. tonight. They were all signed last night, I think. Yeah. All right. The advantage of having a subcommittee before the committee. <laughs> That's good. Less to carry. Right, Jim? Yeah. Um, yeah. And we also received uh, the, the notice of for all municipal employees for the, um, the ethics and conflict of interest law. So to go through that, um, I, I bring in a special request from Cheryl Lepney, who's the keeper of the ethics uh, paperwork, to please remember to um, return the signed document. And the test is every two years. Um, it's The link is on our website because it's the same one our employees take each year. So if you haven't taken it in two years, um, it is something that's required. But if you could send along um, the signed document that's in the back of the packet, the, the handout that's in the packet. And when you finish the test successfully, it's hard not to because you can keep trying until you get the answer right. Um, just print out the certificate and she keeps those on file. Okay. So this thing is only the acknowledging the seat. You've acknowledged. Oh, right. you sign it right here. Okay, so that's great. Um, 
And so agenda items for next month, we have the Applied Arts Department presentation. Is there any other agenda items other than the budget? Okay. Final, any other things that, well? I, I just have to comment because I've been looking at these watercolors and um, they're mm -hmm. incredible. And uh, Dr. Walsh mentioned the art show coming up and every year that just absolutely blows me away. Well, I, I'm not artistic, so I can really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just wanted to um, point them out as a teaser to the art show that anybody who can absolutely should go. They're, it's just an amazing, amazing. Uh, and I hope they bring a subset of you know, that work to their, uh, to their presentation. Yeah, that would be, that would be great. And I'm sure there'll be other items between now and then to add. Yes, I'm sure there'll be more than two items. More than two <laughs> items. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so motion. Thank you for being here. I'm very slow on the update. <laughs> My fault. I move we adjourn this now for South for Regional School Committee open meeting of January 16th. And second. <laughs> Moved by Paul, seconded by Dan. All those in favor.